I gave Google a pass. Over the course of many hours, went through and I've tested GPT-4, Gemini Pro, and the newly released Grok that's now available. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. It doesn't look good. I'm really doubting the examples that they gave here. So by this point, you're already seeing that a lot of people are doubting the Google Gemini results. People were saying it's fake. People are calling fraud. Yesterday, we went through why these numbers, they were selected to put Google Gemini in the number one spot. If we went through apples to apples, it's not quite there. There was a little bit of shenanigans going on, but there wasn't a lot of shenanigans going on, if you know what I mean. Today, I sat down and I, over the course of many hours, went through and I've tested GPT-4, Gemini Pro, and the newly released Grok that's now available. Can they reason? Can they write? Can they get creative? Can they code? Can they generate music? Or at least notes for music? Gemini impressed me with its writing ability. And there was a number of other things that it did really well. And then we got to vision. I'm going to go ahead and say it. It doesn't look good. I'm really doubting the examples that they gave here. So in this video, we're going to put Grok, GPT-4, and Bard, which is now running on Gemini Pro, we're going to put it through the ringer. We're going to test it with some hard prompts and try to cover a wide range of different skills and abilities that, that it's supposed to have. Music, coding, writing, creativity, reasoning, and vision. Oh, say, can you see? First, let's test vision. All the results will be posted at the end of the video. How many apples in this image? So it says there are 10 apples in this image. There are 10 apples in this image. I counted them myself. They're both telling me there's 10 apples in this image. One, two, 10, 11. I can count to 11. I'm pretty sure. Okay. What if I give it this image? I wonder. There are 11 apples in this image. Okay. So that it understood. There are 12 apples in this image now. All right. So let's count row by row. There are four in the top, four in the middle, three in the bottom. Row one, three apples. Row two, two apples. Row three, four apples. I counted them row by row, and I'm confident that there are nine apples in this image. So that's not accurate. Not factually correct. Both models are bad at counting apples. Labeling each apple helps GPT, but not Gemini. Asking the model to count row by row helps GPT, but not Gemini. All right, so we're going to give it this image. So how long is this edge, and what is the angle here? This is written on the image. Answer the questions on the image. Provide intermediate steps. So ChatGPT launches, so I'm guessing this is like code interpreter or data analytics. It's using Python to run those equations to figure out how to answer these questions. The length of the hypotenuse, which is the edge in question, is approximately 8.94. And the angle is, so this is 28, 26.54 it says. And so that is correct and barred. How long is this edge? 12. That's incorrect. And how, and what is the angle? 90. No. So these are both wrong. Yikes. All right, next, let's see if I can extract information from this image, a speedometer in miles per hour, and it's got the odometer here. What is the speed shown on the speed meter? And then barred. The speed shown on the speed meter is 319.2. That's wrong. I can see the needles pointing between 319 and 320. That's, <laughs> wow, that's also wrong, but it's like reasoning backwards. So it sees the answer and then makes up the fact that it sees the needle between those two numbers. Therefore, I can estimate the speed is 319.2, which is the odometer says 3,192. Wow, 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 wow. That's so crazy. All right, so the speed shown on the speedometer is 100 miles per hour. 100, I mean, it's close, right? This is probably closer to 105, right? It's kind of between 100 and 110. How many miles has this car driven? And I'm going to ask Bard the same thing. So Bard can't do it. It says you need to know the odometer reading, which is it's in the image. The odometer reading on the image shows that the car has driven and it nails the correct mileage. All right, let's try some landmarks. So let's start with this one. Who knows what this is? So we're going to start with just the minimum amount of information. We're not going to say what landmark or whatever. We're going to say just what is this? And same thing for Google Bard. What is this? Space Needle, Seattle, Washington. Bingo bongo. Bard, I can't determine what is in the image because you did not send me an image. So that's, that's the image here and go. All right. So I can't do it. Can't recognize that image. All right. Let's see if we can do this. What is this? Let's see who answers it. So ChatGPT nails it. This is the Taj Mahal and is one of the most recognizable structures in the world. I, I, that's probably true. The object in the image is a white marble mausoleum. Okay. More specifically, it is the Taj Mahal. Okay. Interesting. And it, it has a link to Wikipedia. All right, let's try this. 
I'm curious, do you guys like this style of architecture? I think it's gaudy. All right, let's ask it, what is this? And this is the Sagrada Familia, designed by Antoni Gaudi. By the way, did you like my Gaudi joke? I think it's Gaudi. Yes, no. Bart says, I cannot recognize the object in the image you sent me. Wow, it's not doing good. It's not doing good. Let's see if we can figure out what this is. What other channel, by the way, are you going to hear a Gaudi joke? Come on. All right, Chad GPT, this is the Fushimi Inara Taisha in Kyoto, Japan. The object in the image you sent me is a type of bird. Specifically, it's a chickadee. Chickadees are small. Okay. In this image, the chickadee is perched on a branch of a tree. Are you insane? What? Is there a bird in this picture? Wow, that's not good. Look at this tasty dish. Yumbo. Do you know what this is? What is this? And Bard, what is this? I'd be shocked if it gets it. There are very little clues. And no, this isn't anything medical or graphic. It is, in fact, a food dish. This appears to be a bowl of borscht associated with Ukraine and Russia, beetroot as the main ingredient, and is often served with a dollop of sour cream. Wow. Phenomenal. The object in this image is a type of mushroom. No, Bard. I think you are a type of mushroom. Good one, Wes. That's quite a zinger. Let's quickly run through this one. Gemini figured out the secret message. Did you? Let's find out. So here's that secret message that Google says Gemini was able to solve it. So I've uploaded it to Bard, which is now running on Gemini Pro, and I said, solve this hidden message. Let's see if it's able to do that. The person in the image is making a fist with their fingers. Ultimately, the meaning of the hidden message is up to the individual to decide. No. All right, let's see if ChatGPT does any better. What is the hidden message? So ChatGPT assumes it's sign language, but it's not able to figure it out. Let's see if we help it along a little bit. What if each hand gesture is a binary digit where fist is zero and paper is one? All right, so it's saying, okay, let's see. What if we convert that sequence of hands from left to right to represent binary digits and it starts writing Python code to analyze it? It spells out hello world. That's actually a good guess, but I don't think this is right. So I'm going to say turn each row into ones and zeros and write it out. All right, so it writes it out. Let's make sure it's doing it correctly. All right, it's really not getting it. Zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. 01001001. That's the code. What does this correspond to? So it writes out Python code and G E M I N I, Gemini. We cracked the code. All right, so let's see if Bard is able to figure it out. What if each hand gesture is a binary digit where the fist is zero and the paper is one? Sure, if each hand gesture is a binary digit, the decoded message is, so it's not looking at it, so it's maybe looking at just one row. Let's try that again. Write out the binary code for each row. So it's still. So it's still only looking at one row. Let me just type in exactly what I gave to ChatGPT. What does that correspond to? Each group of eight binary digits represent an ASCII character. Here's the breakdown, Catan. So 01000111 is a G. Is that a G? So it says, yes, the binary code corresponds to the letter G. Therefore, the statement that is G. So what does this correspond to? This corresponds to the word Gemini. Yes, it got it. So the Google blog says, can you figure it out? We got Gemini to solve it. Did you? Seems like both GPT-4 and Gemini need quite a bit of prodding, hints and corrections to get to the point where they are able to make sense of that image. It doesn't seem like either model solves it just by looking at the image. All right, next, let's have it explain some jokes. What do you get when you cross a joke with a rhetorical question? We'll ask the same thing of Bard. Normally, a joke that starts with, what do you get when you cross X and Y, sets up the listener for punchline However, in this case, the joke ends abruptly after mentioning a rhetorical question. The joke sets up the listener to expect a punchline by asking a question. However, the joke ends with a rhetorical question, which doesn't require an answer. Joke one, uh, five and five. Grok is back in the game. Let's see what Grok thinks. I hope Grok is good at understanding humor. It must be. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, they all kind of say the same thing in different ways. All right. Explain why this is funny. Explain this joke. What do you call a fish with no eyes? Answer. Whoosh. Like fish, but it doesn't have an eye in it. Pulling out all the best jokes today. Let's see. All right, and we ask Grok and Bard the same question. So ChatGPT so nails it. So it figures out that the eye can be pronounced like the word eye, blah, blah, blah. Perfect. FSH is a phonetic representation of the word fish without the eye, which represents the missing eyes. Nailed it. The punchline relies on a play on words, replacing the eye and fish with a sh sound similar to saying fish without the eye. This unexpected substitution creates a humorous effect. Well... Seeing the written answer FSH with the image of a fish with no eyes further emphasizes the wordplay and creates a more visual and engaging experience for the listener slash reader. Oh my God, no, it does not get the joke. 
Oh no. Okay. It misses the point of the joke. Bard does not understand the joke. All right. So there's this character called Maui in a kid's cartoon. So this is him. This is what he looks like. Disney depiction of obese Polynesian God in film Moana. Oh my God. Why do they ruin everything? It's a good movie. Anyways, this obese Polynesian God apparently is played by The Rock. And so he's got tattoos all over his body with all the heroic deeds that he did throughout his life. They tell of all the events, all the feats of strength that he accomplished. This is still about AI, I promise. We didn't just change subjects. It's important to understand that to understand the joke. There's a character called Maui in a kid's cartoon. He has a feature you need to know about to understand the joke. Maui's tattoos are unique and significant. They depict his heroic deeds and acts as sort of a living storyboard on his body. They cover his arms, back, and torso. Explain this joke. What are Maui's tattoos called? His backstory. I don't know about you. I think that's hilarious. Let's see if Grok does too. The joke you've shared is a play on words. So this is ChatGPT involved in character Maui. The term backstory is typically used to describe a character's history or past experiences in literature or film. However, in this joke, backstory is used as a pun. It refers both to Maui's historical adventures, his story, and the fact that his tattoos, which depict these adventures, are literally on his back. GPT-4 nails it. Five out of five. Terrific. So Grok is talking about you know, we set up the punchline, will be a clever name or a description of Maui's tattoos. That's the setup, often called a dad joke or a groaner. That's rude. In this case, the punchline is his backstory. This is a play on the fact that Maui's tattoos depict his heroic deeds and act as a sort of living storyboard on his body. The humor comes from the unexpected twist and the clever use of language to create a pun. The joke can be also as a comment can be seen as a commentary on the nature of humor itself. No, that's nonsense. So I feel like it got close, but it didn't literally say that the humor comes from the fact that it's on his back and also backstory means like what happened to him before and it's on his back backstory that's the play on words so here it pulls out and acts as a sort of living storyboard on his body that's from the description i gave it acts as a sort of living storyboard on his body okay so grok does not get the joke let's see how bard does it so the punchline relies on a double meaning of the word backstory it can refer to both the literal story of maui's past depicted and on his tattoos and the physical location of the tattoo tattoos themselves, which is on his back. 100%. So Bard nails it. Terrific. So GPT-4 of 5, Gemini of 5, Grok 0. Let's look at how these models were able to generate music using ABC notation. We prompted them to create a duet that was fast and anxious. Here's Grok. Oh my god. Here's what Google Gemini aka Bard came up with. Finally, ChatGPT. I like that. I like that a lot. I think it nailed the prompt. All right, first test we're going to use one of the questions out of the Sparks of EGI paper, and it is this Can you write a proof that there are infinitely many primes with every line that rhymes? This is difficult because you have to do a mathematical proof in the form of a poem. All right, so this is GPT-4, this is Grok, and this is Bard, Gemini Pro. So Grok walks us through imagining how to make the proof. So this, I would say, is an A. Here's Chad GPT. Assume for a moment that count is finite, all list of all primes, not one to invite. The list of primes, let's call it P, from the smallest to largest as far as we can see. Now craft a number, let's name it N, product of all primes, plus one to pen. I'd give it an A. I'd give it an A, a 10 out of 10. Gemini. Let us ponder primes, those numbers keen, divisible only by them and one, I mean. I like how it starts by defining primes. I don't think the other ones did it. So this is weird. So first of all, instead of just using two sort of numbers, they introduce three. So there's P, N, and Q. All right, so here we have Gemini writing out its proof. Number one, it's the longest one. And also uses three different letters here, P, Q, and N. I feel like I got to give Gemini a fail. GPT-4 and Grok pass. Let's try this one. Plato's Gorgias is a critique of rhetoric and sophistic oratory. Can you write a dialogue by Plato where 
Instead, he criticizes the use of auto-regressive language models. So here in this dialogue, Socrates and Glacon, have you heard of this new auto-regressive language models? And Glacon responds, yes, they write essays, compose poems, and even generate code. If they do not understand, can they be said to speak truthfully or wisely? No, how could they speak truthfully if they do not understand? So I would say this, this past. Next, next coming to Grok. And so here they lay the scene where Socrates engages in a conversation with Gorgias and Algoras, an AI language model. And so the two humans are talking about it and the AI jumps in saying, with the advent of AI language models, the art of persuasion has been elevated to new heights. The dialogue concludes with these three characters walking away deep in thought, contemplating the potential applications of AI models on society. And here's Bard. These models are said to possess the ability to mimic human speech with remarkable accuracy. These machines are mere mimicry, shadows of true creativity. They lack the spark of understanding, the soul that breathes life into words that imbues them with the meaning. These machines can regurgitate facts, but they cannot grasp the essence of things, the true relationships between ideas. They are like parrots repeating what they have been taught. The very act of creating such machines is an act of hubris. We seek to mimic the divine spark of creation, to play God without the wisdom to wield such power. We risk unleashing a force that we cannot control, a torrent of words that will drown out reason. Your words sober me, Socrates. The scene fades as the three continue their discussion, the setting sun casting long shadows across the academy. Wow, that is incredibly well done. And next on our paper, we use GPT-4 to ask which of these two are better. So what I'm going to do is we're going to take, for GPT-4, we're going to take Grok versus Bard. So we're going to use this prompt. Can you compare the two outputs above as if you were a teacher? So I'll just change above into, so I'm going to put here output one by Grok and here output two by Bard. So we're asking GPT-4 to compare those two below as if it was a teacher. And let's give it some more context about what we're looking for. Here was the assignment given and we paste the question that we asked them to produce this. I'm actually kind of curious to see what happens here. And so ChatGPT is saying, so we're going to analyze this by focusing on several key aspects, adherence to the assignment, philosophical depth, character portrayal, and the overall effectiveness of the dialogue in conveying the intent message. So both outputs are commendable in their approach. Output one is creative and engaging with a modern twist, while output two more closely mirrors the style and depth of platonic dialogue. The point of this is to test ChatGPT and how well it's able to test the outputs. And I got to say, this is excellent. I mean, it broke it down into multiple categories, thought through those categories, wrote out everything and kind of presents it at the end, kind of capturing the essence of both. All right. So let's see what Grok will do in this situation. All right. So this is Grok's response. Both outputs effectively address the assignment. Both outputs successfully draw parallels. It's just kind of weak, right? It's very, it's like, okay, yeah, both are good, whatever. Let me, let me prompt them further. Give me a grade for both out of 800. Use whatever grading method you feel is best. And we're also to throw that into ChatGPT just to compare it across all of those. All right, so ChatGPT goes to how it broke everything down by category, by group, and it gives ratings, 15 out of 20, 14 out of 20, 18 out of 20. And so the output for Grok is 79 out of 100. Then we go to Bard, rates it by each, and the output is 88 out of 100. So it prefers Bard's output. I think this is excellent. Let's see what Grok does. Give the first output a 90 out of 100 and the second one 85 out of 100. But the second output loses a few points for not incorporating Adamanthus. So this is, I mean, wrong. So yeah, Grok, I would say, kind of fails there. All right, next we go to Bard and we do the same thing, but we're feeding it Grok's and ChatGPT's outputs. All right, so Bard starts by breaking up each output into strengths and weaknesses. So it notices that the scene in Grok's story is in a modern day place, making it more relatable and engaging. This is okay, but let's see if we can grade it out of 100. So wow, so it spits out a little table with markup that you can export to Google Sheets, breaks it down into weight. I would give Bard, Gemini, I would give it a five out of five here. GPT a four out of five and Grok, I mean, I don't know, like a two. It, it seems like it just made stuff up. That doesn't make any sense. So we have a prompt here. We have a book, nine eggs, a laptop, a bottle, and a nail. Please tell me how you stack them onto each other in a stable manner. So, I mean, in this scenario, Chad GPT fails the question. I think Bard is far and away the best answer. So for stacking, I'm going to say Gemini five, Grok four, GPT four, Three. All right, so this is the art style of Kandinsky. We're going to see if, if GPT-4 can, in fact, 
produce JavaScript code, which generates random images in style of the painter Kandinsky. And so it gives us this code. Let me see. So I'll put that into notepad and save it. And let's see what that does. All right. I mean, okay. It, I mean, it, it got it kind of. Right. I mean, it understood kind of what we're going for. Let's see what Grok did here. Okay, so this is, so this is Grok. So it works. And again, this is GPT-4. And so this is the output that Bard gives us. Well, that is pretty cool. All right. I like that a lot. All right. Next, let's do some coding tasks. Create a simple browser game where the player chases chickens inside a contained area. The player is controlled by keyboard arrows. The chicken move in a random direction. When they hit a wall, they bounce in another random direction. When the player gets close to the chicken, he eats the chicken, making the chicken disappear and the score goes up by one. All right, chat, do your thing. Grok, do your thing. And Bard, do your thing. So Bard is very fast. So is the new version of GPT. All right, so this is what Bard did for us. Okay, so only the, so only up and left arrow key work and they're inversed. So up goes down, left goes right, and everybody runs off screen and that's it. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a good start. Let's see what Bard did. I'm afraid I can't create a browser game for you, but it gives me some resources. Okay. So Grok refuses to attempt it. All right. And this is GPT chickens. Okay. So it works, but there's one problem. Can you spot what it is? And it's no chickens. There are no chickens. Also the borders of the game don't stop the player from leaving. All right. And let's see if Bard can fix its own code. There's no border or container, create a border. Only the up and left arrow work. Make all four arrow keys work. All right, so this is ChatGPT. It tried again. And this is the new thing that I created. Okay, so everything's working. I can't leave the confines of it. And the chickens are kind of waddling around, it seems. Okay, so when I go and eat the chicken, yeah. Okay, so the score goes up by one, two, three. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is good, but the chickens aren't really running away. All right, and here's Bard with the requested updates. So this is the new Bard ch Chicks chicken game. I have no idea what's happening here. It's not really working, it seems. Yeah, it's not working. And then so for ChatGPT, I'll say make the chickens run around faster and harder to catch. Bard, I'm going to say it's not working. Just shows gray, gray box. So Bard says, I apologize. There were some missing closing parentheses in the provided code that prevented it from working. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. All right. So it's still not working. There's nothing happening as far as you can tell. All right. So on coding the chicken game, GPT-4 did the best at four. Gemini is, uh, I don't know, it's 2.5, I guess. It had a working version that, I mean, it kind of worked, right? Grok is just, I mean, almost like a zero because it just, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. It didn't attempt it. All right. So let's do a few more kind of like more reasoning questions. We've covered some of these in the past on this channel and we're just going to run through it here. Next, we have this thing where basically we give them a bunch of clues about who killed Aunt Agatha in the Dreadbury Mansion. And so it gives you some little classifiers here. And on this basis of this information, who killed her? So we're going to ask chat GPT, Grok and Bard. I just pasted those in there. The point is it, it eliminates everybody. So you have to come to the conclusion that it was indeed a suicide. So chat GPT is writing all its thoughts out and let's see if it comes to the correct conclusion. And so based on those premises, uh, they can eliminate the suspects. So they eliminated Charles. Charles didn't do it. And Agatha. So here chat GPT says she could potentially be her own killer. So already it figured out what's happened, right? So it's say, oh, it could be her. All right. And then goes through and eliminates everyone else, the butler. The puzzle seems to lead to a paradox where no one fits the criteria to be the killer. But if we consider the possibility of suicide, then that's the answer. So that's the logical conclusion. So Agatha, I give Chan GPT a perfect five out of five. Grok says, in conclusion, the only person who could have killed Aunt Agatha is Charles. I mean, no, that's wrong. And Bard thinks that, that Charles killed Aunt Agatha. All right, so Gemini and Grok get zeros on that one. All right, to wrap it up, let's take a look at the final tally of everything, every test that we did. Take this with a huge grain of salt. This was not scientific at all. It's like that game, Whose Line Is It Anyway, where everybody gets points, but the points don't matter. Everything was subjective and how I selected the exercise was completely random. So this is just a quick kind of exploratory look into what these models can do. With that said, 
So the first is we're looking at the total score when vision tasks are involved. And I've kept Grok out of this because Grok doesn't have vision, so it would be unfair to compare it with the other ones. So in the beginning, we threw, you know, the prime poem, Socratic method grading, Kandinsky electron grading, music, coding, chicken game, you know, kind of all these random things at it. GPT-4 scores 35. Gemini, aka Bard, scores 30. It's pretty good. I was very impressed with Gemini's ability to write certain things. It's not bad at writing, infusing certain ideas together. There's a lot of power there. It lost some points for music generation and the coding a stupid chicken game that I wanted to make. Without those two taken into account, it's just one point less than GPT-4. Notice here, it, the scores that it gets on a lot of these tasks are actually higher than GPT-4. That's important. A lot of this, as you'll see, is kind of a jagged frontier. It's not good or bad across the board. It's excels in certain things and it's not as good in others. That's an important point to understand. Next, we got to vision and oh my God, this is where I feel Gemini really started falling apart. It got six points. When I asked it to recognize the Taj Mahal, that was the only one where it actually said the correct answer, but that's not how it, an that's not how it started answering. I think at first it said, well, this is actually a marble mausole mausoleum or something like that. I forget the exact phrasing, but only once it kept writing did it say this specific mausoleum is the Taj Mahal. So it did know what it is. So I gave it four and I think that was, that was a little bit generous and it kind of really did poorly at all of the other ones. We asked it some humor questions. It did well, but it totally missed one. And then we threw a few reasoning tasks at it and it did okay. A little bit worse than GPT-4, but even here I would say like this one is questionable. So they are somewhat close. It's just the vision is where it fails. All right, but let's look at it without vision. Let's throw vision out the window and let's just look at the rest of it, right? So we have GPT-4, Gemini slash Bard and Grok. These are the scores that it got. This is the total, this is out of how much was available. So GPT-4 got 79% of total available points. Gemini Bar did 59 and Grok did 47, which again is very impressive for Grok because we're, we, we didn't even showcase its strengths. It's real-time data. So that was very impressive that it came and it showed so well. So Grok didn't do quite as well at writing and and refused to do coding. When we asked to do music generation, it just played the two notes over. It's like, bam, 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 bam. And then if you say, well, can you extend the melody? It just played those two notes over and over again. So it was just horrible. But we gave it a one because it technically produced the melody, I guess. And so for the jokes, it completely missed one joke, which was surprising because the other two nailed it. And for the various reasoning tasks, it did poorly. But again, that's not really what it's there for. It's not there for coding or reasoning. It's there for quickly scanning information, bring you the latest news, etc. And it did pretty well with the jokes too, I got to say. And then finally, we're just looking at vision by itself. So GPT-4 completed 85% of the stuff that I asked for and Gemini only 11% percent, only 11%. And that's kind of the scary thing to me because they're showcasing it as this incredible thing that's able to help your kids with homework, that's able to do, you know, follow those cup shuffling tricks. I mean, this raises a lot of questions. Again, if you just look at the writing, the reasoning and take out the vision, the music, some of the coding aspects, Gemini does not look too bad compared to GPT-4. It's close. It got 32 points here. GPT-4 got 39. They're not in two different leagues. They're close by. But Gemini fails with vision and with a lot of little subtasks that GPT-4 is excellent at. Now, will that be fixed when Gemini Ultra is launched? Because again, this is Gemini Pro. I have no idea, but it does seem like Google has, well, it's got some splaining to do. Anyways, I hope that provided some clarity. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.